on Sky News Australia. This is the Rita Panahi Show. Good evening and welcome to the Rita Panahi Show. Coming up tonight, Foreign Minister Penny Wong mocked far and wide for sending out a message on Easter Sunday celebrating the Trans Day of Visibility. We'll have a look at the latest news poll data, including young voters swinging strongly towards the coalition. Josh Hammer will be here with the latest from the US, including more homeowners losing their properties to squatters. Kinsey Schofield will have the latest royal and celebrity news. And of course, there'll be plenty of lefties losing it, including a climate change crazy BBC journalist being humbled by a South American leader. Does that give you the right? No, Does no, that no, no. give you the right to release that, that all of this right. carbon? Does from... that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change. But first, the latest news poll data is illuminating on a number of fronts with support for Labor nosediving among a number of demographics. A strong swing to the coalition that was unexpected, well, unexpected if you listen to the so-called political analysts who are forever advising the coalition to lean left and not have strong conservative leaders like Peter Dutton. Let's look at the breakdown by age. You can see support for the Greens is really only evident among the youngest voters. One in four voters under 34 are opting for the Greens. That's frightening. That number, though, reduces fairly dramatically for those who are aged uh, between 35 to 49. That's 15%. And it dips further in the next age bracket to just 7%. Among the over 65s, only 2% are backing the Greens. And Greens are also most popular with the unemployed, those listed as not working. Among those who are in full-time work or who are retired, the Greens have the least amount of support, whilst those who work part-time or are unemployed or not working have much higher rates for the Greens. The gender breakup is also interesting, with women leaning centre-left while men lean centre-right and an increasing number turning their back on the Albanese government. And support for the federal labour has also plummeted in Western Australia. The state-by-state -state data, also fascinating. The coalition now ahead in New South Wales, uh, sorry, ahead in Western Australia and drawn level in New South Wales for the first time since the last federal election. Now to a superb piece in today's Australian by Nick Cater, on the welfare dependence of the renewable sector. Nick writes, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, prefer to avoid the loaded term subsidy. It speaks instead of accelerating the pace of pre-commercial innovation by supporting improvements in the competitiveness of renewable energy. ARENA has been handing out welfare checks to pre-competitive businesses at the rate of roughly one a week since it was established by the Gillard government back in 2012. Last week, Energy Minister Chris Bowen and Anthony Albanese travelled to the Hunter Valley to announce ARENA's 642nd grant. It was a whopper, a cool billion dollars to help a start-up company that's backed by Mike Cannon-Brooks and Malcolm Turnbull to build a solar panel manufacturing plant. Uh, yes, those two really need that acceleration of pre-commercial innovation, don't they? Nick Cater, columnist for The Australian and senior fellow at the Menzies Research Centre, joins me now. Nick, that is such a fantastic piece. I encourage everybody, get today's Australian, read it. Tell me, though, tell the audience now how much are renewable subsidies costing taxpayers? You want the full figure? I couldn't possibly give you that, Rita. There's so many subsidies coming from so many well, different directions. No one this can. one body, ARENA, <laughs> yeah, ARENA, which was set up in 2012 by the Gillard government to sort of kickstart renewable energy, they've given away $2.3 billion already, plus another billion dollars for Mike Cannon-Brooks and uh, Malcolm Turnbull's backed company that's going to build, supposedly build solar panels. And that's 642 individual grants. I mean, it, it's just extraordinary because the thing is, Rita, I thought Chris Bowen and the CSIRO were telling us that renewable energy is the cheapest form of electricity there is. Well, if that's the case... Mm. 
why on earth would you need to subsidise it? I mean, the thing would just walk... And, and, and if it's a big thing, this technology, this is a thing we're all going to need in the rest of the 21st century, it's going to be so much in demand. Don't you think that Mike Cannon-Brooks might stick up a lazy billion of his own into this? I mean, they're, they're very shy about putting their money in their own in their own pocket. They're putting their hands in their own pockets, Rita, and uh, not so shy about putting their hands in the taxpayer's pocket, as far as I can see. Well, uh, you're right. Uh, renewable energy is welfare dependent as well as weather dependent. It suffers from a condition a psychologist might recognise as dependent personality disorder, a pervasive and excessive need to be taken care of, leading to a submissive and clinging behaviour, fear of separation and difficulty making decisions without reassurance from others. Nick, the way you describe this sector, uh, you make renewables sound like some sort of a toxic relationship. We need to uh, escape. I, I think we do. I mean, they, they live in a universe that doesn't work like the rest of the economy. You know, it, their first stop is to go and see what they can get out of the government to kickstart their businesses. Uh, whereas rather than most companies, of course, have to raise their own capital. So it, it's and it's become, I think, like a dependency relationship, like welfare dependency, because they're so used to doing this now. They've been doing it for 15 years or more that now they don't even think, well, we might have to find that capital ourselves. But, you know, I just think it does blow Chris Bowen's claim out of the water that this is somehow the best and cheapest form of electricity. Because if it was, well, it would just be able to stand on its own two feet, wouldn't it? But, of course, it can't. It can't. And, and what yes. we talked about in that column, you know, the $3.2 uh, billion, that's just the start of it. You've got all the money that, that they get in renewable energy certificates every time they power up their, uh, mm. their windmills or, or solar panels, you know, plus all the subsidies they get from, uh, you know, local councils have to help them expand the roads so that they can bring the turbines in. They don't play... They don't pay full dollar for that either. So right the way along the line from cradle to grave, we're subsidising them. And, um, you know, I, I, I just don't think that that's And all right, the infrastructure really that we're don't. building, all the infrastructure we're building, that's why the bills are skyrocketing. Uh, and you can see why so many of the people who are investing in that sector are dead set against nuclear because... If you've got nuclear energy, if you've got a reliable source of energy that is not weather dependent, then you don't really need renewables, do you? It, it makes renewables uh, uh, obsolete in, in a way. Now, moving along, Facebook's parent company, Meta, is dodging an estimated $262 million worth of tax to Australia by shifting revenue made from Aussie ads to Ireland. This is despite... $1.25 billion from Australian businesses going to Meta. They're advertising on their platform, but Meta's sending $1.03 billion of that to another group as payment for advertising inventory and declaring they only made a profit of $77 million to the Australian government. And, Nick, it's not just Meta. We've got Apple, Google and Microsoft all claiming that just 5 to 20% of their revenue is taxable. Lefties like to say that the rich don't pay their fair share of taxes. That's not normally true, but it is true when it comes to big tech. They seem to have no allegiance to Australia whatsoever or no loyalty, which is fine, except that when it comes to the political debate, of course, they want to buy right into it. You know, they'll take one side in the voice debate, for instance, or the transgender debate, and, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll take people off if they disagree with that view. Well, you kind of it both ways. I mean, if you want to be part of the Australian uh, political debate by allowing stuff on and not allowing others and setting your algorithm and so forth, then you pay your taxes fair and square. You don't do this... Uh, it's perfectly legal, I guess, but... But it's just not really ethical or fair and just shows this is not a company operating in good faith towards Australians, I think. Now, Nick, let's talk about Foreign Minister Penny Wong. She's been mocked far and wide. She was ratioed on X. That's something you don't want to happen to you on, on social media. And why? Because she posted this on Easter Sunday about celebrating something called Trans Day of Visibility. Uh, among the more than 6,000 responses she got was this from Sal Grover, who wrote, 
Yeah, we know exactly what you stand with, uh, men or who you stand with, men. May I remind you that other people have rights and demanding women give up our sex-based rights for men who claim to be women is many things, but it sure as SHIT isn't equality. Another popular response was this from Polly Bard who wrote, It's Easter! And please explain how you can commit to trans rights without destroying women's rights. Nobody has yet. Uh, if you scroll through those uh, 6,000 odd messages, there aren't too many that are in support, Nick. Uh, what would possess her to post this on Easter Sunday, especially oh. after the Biden White House cops so much heat for doing the same thing? It, it, it's an incredible lapse of judgment for her. I mean, I presume she knew it was Easter Sunday. She might not. She might not be a churchgoer. I don't know. But oh, she would. You know, I mean, of course she, she would. You don't need to be a churchgoer I mean, to know it's Easter Sunday. Well, you do. It's hard, hard to find a bottle shop open, right? You know that. That's Easter Sunday, and I long may it <laughs> stay that way, to be honest. But, look... This is wrong on so many levels, Rita. First of all, this organisation, what they call Transvillability something or other, you know, they must have known that March 31st was Easter Sunday. Visibility, I think it is. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, uh, to pass up misinformation on, but whatever they are, they knew. They must have known it was Easter Sunday on, on March the 31st and they've deliberately scheduled it. Now, that's an insult to Christians. It's an insult to our Judeo-Christian heritage, and that's wrong. But for Penny Wong to repost it... The thing is, doesn't Penny Wong... Maybe somebody should point out that we actually had a referendum on identity politics last year, and she lost. <laughs> she heard side lost. I mean, that's what the voice was. It was, a, a, it was about saying, well, everybody has the same rights. Everybody deserves equal respect in this country. Nobody deserves special respect. And uh, this whole identity politics thing is so out of kilter with what most Australians think that I think Penny Wong is just proving once again that she and the Albanese government really are just way out of touch with ordinary people. Well, the activists will tell you, well, this day has been on the 31st of March for 10, 15 years, so they weren't intending to take over Easter Sunday, but it has coincided with Easter Sunday this year, but there's no reason for politicians to be posting messages acknowledging this day on Easter Sunday. I mean, and that that's where the idiocy comes in. You expect the activists to be activists. You would expect the politicians to have a little bit more sense. And there are so many other days recognising this uh, group. It's not like they're invisible for the other 364 days. Now, let's go to the New York Post. They're reporting that ISIS-K terrorists could very easily make their way across the US's uh, completely unprotected southern border to carry out a Moscow-style terror attack. Of course, uh, they killed some 143 innocent people there like, earlier this month. Uh, We've got, Nick, millions of undocumented migrants entering the US. Uh, why wouldn't a terrorist cell take advantage of the Biden administration's, uh, well, losing control of that southern border? That's a very easy way to enter the country if you've got evil intent. Well, that's right. And there was a case, I think, a week or so back, as you might recall, where uh, they'd arrested some uh, Hamas operatives who tried to come across that way. So it's wide open. This is the problem. This is why we have borders, of course, to keep our people safe, to keep our citizens safe. And uh, and this is a terrible um, lapse of the duty of care by the Biden administration. We, we seem to sort of think that the ISIS terrorism thing is all in the past, Rita, but look, there are dozens of attacks this year alone uh, caused by Muslim extremists around the world. It's just that they don't seem to make the papers anymore. Perhaps they should to remind us that they, they haven't suddenly gone quiet, you know, they haven't suddenly uh, turned over a new leaf. These people are really very, very driven by this, this uh, wicked ideology and uh, they are driven to do terrible acts and we need to be alert all the time. Nick Cater, thank you so much for your time this evening.
Now, it's been over two weeks since Meghan Markle launched her lifestyle brand, American Riviera Orchard, what, on Instagram, a name so pretentiously stupid one wonders whether she just typed fancy name for lifestyle website into ChatGBT. She launched the site alongside a soft glamour video showing her picking flowers and walking around her estate in a big black ball gown, as you do. But since then... Nothing. Crickets. Just a few leaks from trademark applications that suggest this is going to be another celebrity wellness site like Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop or Kourtney Kardashian's Poosh. Royal reporter Kinsey Schofield joins me now. Kinsey, what can we expect from American Riviera Orchard? Is it a... I can't think of a more pretentious name, but are we going to have another Kardashian or Gwyneth Paltrow style lifestyle wellness website? Well, I'd rather um, I'd rather compare it to Chrissy Teigen. Remember, they were both on Deal or No Deal together. Oh uh, no! And, they, oh, <laughs> and they're both God. very woke characters. No. Um, but I, I love that you use the word pretentious because that was my first instinct. I mean, this is a woman that wrote Congress. Remember, over you know, um, she wanted I think it was extended parental leave. She wrote Congress telling them that she ate at the four ninety nine salad bar at Sizzler, which completely contradicted the Instagram posts that she had posted years ago about how her dad would take her to all of these upscale Beverly Hills delis after dance class. You know, it, it you know, it always just depends on who she's in front of, though, the way she talks about her past. Um, but yeah, the American Riviera Orchard, uh, s- someone compared the name to a senior living facility. She's definitely trying to, I guess, plant herself, really plant herself in this Santa Barbara community um, which is interesting because she's only lived there four years. It's like being a duchess for only 19 months and insisting people still refer to you as one. <laughs> now to King Charles. He's made uh, his first outing since his cancer diagnosis, appearing at the Easter Sunday service at St George's Chapel in Windsor. He appeared, Kinsey, quite uh, well, happy. Do you, we know much about how his treatment is progressing and when he is expected to be back on full-time duties for the Royals. You know, he was shaking hands with people at this Easter event, which did surprise me because that was one of the things early on when we found out about his cancer that we knew would have to take a back seat uh, just just because they wanted to continue to protect his health while his immune system might be jeopardized through some of this, these treatments. So I think the fact that he was shaking hands is a very good sign if we look at um, the last few months of, of his treatments uh, for a, a mystery cancer. Additionally, when one individual said get well soon, he jokingly replied, I'm doing my best. So obviously he's in very good spirits. I do think we can expect to see him at Royal Ascot. I do believe, you know, he's doing everything in his power to to have a, a prominent, um, to, to have some sort of prominent role at Trooping the Color. Uh, so I think that it, it looks like he's on the up and up, but with everything going on with the Princess of Wales now, um, I know it was important to him to be out front and to show everyone things are going to be okay. Now, we have to talk about Sean Diddy Combs. He used to be called Puff Daddy. Uh, He's a rap mogul. He's not just an artist. He is uh, hugely successful and he's been planning a comeback. But now he's planning his defence against allegations ranging from sexual assault and human trafficking to shooting cover-ups. And it seems uh, there's a lot of people coming out of the woodwork now, Kinsey, telling their stories about his behaviour, all of which is uh, he is denying at this point. He hasn't been charged with anything yet, but federal agents are watching him as part of an ongoing investigation into sex trafficking allegations. Some of his associates have fled to the Caribbean. Um, And this is becoming a scandal, Kinsey, that's... uh, being compared to those of Harvey Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein. 
And R. Kelly, yeah. Um, for instance, uh, Natanya mm. Rubin, she's one of three people that was hurt in the 1990. 1999 club incident there's a couple of incidents so uh, let me get my you know ears right Mm. you know she has bullet fragments inside of her face and she said that she is willing to allow them to go in there and um, try to collect those if she if, if it could finally get uh, P. Diddy in trouble for um, this incident that happened in 1999 that he was never charged for. Um, I've been asked about him repeatedly, and I I did work with him. I threw a party with him years ago um, for his Ciroc vodka, and I had no issues with him. Of course, there were cameras following us, so I'm sure that that had a lot Mm. to do with it. Um, But I have been surprised by, you know, what I would what I would consider consider his downfall over the last few weeks. Mm, Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned that case in New York and the female victim there. She was shot in the face. She survived and she is willing to have the bullet fragments removed from her face. There's still bullet fragments there. She has always said from day one, she saw who shot her. She has always alleged it was P. Diddy, not the guy who took the blame. But... Diddy wasn't charged. He had weapons charges he beat. Someone else served 10 years for that shooting. But she has never deviated from her story. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying she has been steadfast in saying she saw who shot her and, according to her, it was P. Diddy. Um, Yeah, it's an incredible story and we're going to hear plenty more about it. Before you go, this is an unsavoury story, if you ask me, but Miley Cyrus's family drama is being laid bare again by her mum, who has a habit of oversharing. Her name is Tish, and Tish, who was previously married to Miley's dad, country music star Billy Ray Cyrus, well, she's now talking about how her new marriage is perhaps in a little bit of trouble. She talked about this on her daughter Brandy's podcast, Sorry We're Stoned, to say that she's having some issues with her new husband, Aussie actor Dominic Purcell. Now, what's what's particularly interesting here is that Dominic Purcell reportedly dated her youngest daughter, Noah, before he got together with the mother. I mean, is it ever okay? I can't believe I'm even asking this. Is it ever okay, Kinsey, to date your daughter's ex uh, I'd say no, but I think like one of the worst parts of this story is that the Sorry We're Stoned podcast is also also Tish's podcast. It's it's Tish's and Brandy's. So the Sorry We're Stoned, oh. I think it gives you just a, a you know it gives you a better idea of who these people are. And I'm just going to go ahead and say I blame Billy Ray Cyrus and the Disney Channel for all of this uh, because <laughs> it, it's it's the classic dysfunction. I, I you know I could never date somebody that my mother dated, but you know what. But Princess Diana dated her sister's ex-boyfriend and ended up marrying him. So, you know, it's not oh, completely. Okay. It's true. Yeah. Sister is a different thing. I mean, sisters, yeah. if, if it's your daughter, and the daughter yeah. is obviously not happy because uh, she refused to go along to this wedding. Uh, so she, she she went, I think, to Walmart whilst her mum was getting married. So, yes, strange folks, celebrities, very strange indeed. Kinsey Schofield, thank you so much for your time tonight. And don't go anywhere, Josh Hammer's up next on the White House's very PC Easter celebrations. Oh, goodness me. Plus a bumper edition of Lefties Losing It. Welcome back. And now it's time for Lefties Losing It. Let's start with possibly the most annoying woman in the world. She's got this important message. Nuclear family is a total f-ing scam. The nuclear family is a total f-ing scam. Please allow me to be moan that we're not supposed to be doing this alone. The nuclear family is a total f-ing scam. So she calls the nuclear family a scam and then she's screaming about 
We're not meant to be alone. Oh, goodness me. Now to a dude called Hassan, who is uh, some sort of social justice warrior from America, a streamer who's uh, in Australia at the moment. Like, we don't have enough lefties losing it already here. He attended a pro-Palestinian protest, but while there, some of his fans were not happy with him because he was drinking Coke Zero. He wasn't being sufficiently anti-Israel. Have a look. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot really to lovely. say you need to stop drinking Three, Coke Zero two, on stream. Why? It's boycott. Wait, is it? No. You're preaching pro Palestine no, and you're no, drinking all this boycott stuff. So please, Thank you. <laughs> at least pretend. Do it off stream. No, please, okay, I'll put, it in, I'll put it in a glass. <laughs> <laughs> is Pepsi okay? No! Is it? <laughs> okay. No soda, sir. I didn't know. I didn't know it was like that. <laughs> I'm trying to stop it, isn't that? <laughs> Yes, Hassan, at least pretend, drink it off stream. And no, Pepsi is not okay. Now to this young lady, lady, or I don't know, she identifies as all the pronouns, he, she, they. This is M. Adams, an educator and a leader of a group called the Movement for Black Lives. So as Ananda mentioned, my name is M. Adams. I use all gender pronouns said respectfully. So that means it is appropriate for you to refer to me as she, her. You could also use he or him or they or them. All of those uh, work for me, feel good to me and recognize me uh, for how I want to be seen. She called herself a non-dimension there. I haven't heard that one before. I'm going to add that to my long list of identities. Now to Melbourne, Australia's lefty losing at capital, where they were again blocking roads, causing mayhem in the CBD. And this short video was proudly posted by a Greens politician who was there, Samantha Ratnam. Does Albanese represent us? Does Penny Wong represent us? Hey, your party is in an unofficial alliance with a... Labor, if you don't like their policies, I don't know, withdraw your support, but I doubt that's going to be happening anytime soon. Now let's end on this work of beauty. Watch as this climate change crazy BBC journalist is fact-checked and humbled by Dr Irfan Ali, the president of Guyana. Let's start with the BBC introduction. You know straight away what his angle's going to be. Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker, and today I am in Guyana, South America, a country of some 800,000 people, which right now can claim to have the fastest growing economy in the world. The reason oil, vast reserves of the stuff located offshore. My guest today is Guyana's president, Irfan Ali. His country's newfound oil riches have stoked tensions with neighboring Venezuela. They've also raised questions about this country's vulnerability to climate change. So is oil really a blessing or a curse? Spoiler, it's a blessing. Yes, it is. It's a blessing. The oil is always a blessing. Now let the humbling begin. Take it away, Dr. Ali. Let's take a big picture look at what's going on here. Over the next uh, decade, two decades, it is uh, expected that there will be $150 billion worth of oil and gas extracted off your coast. It's an extraordinary figure. But think of it in practical terms. That means, according to many experts, more than 2 billion tonnes of carbon emissions will come from your seabed, from those reserves, and be released into the atmosphere. I, I don't know if you, as a head of state, went to the COP Let me in stop Dubai. You right there. Let me stop you right there. Do you know that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined? A forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon? A forest that we have kept alive? A forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, Does no, no, that no, give no. you I, the that, right that, to release that, that all of this right. carbon? Fancy berating the leader of a country with the fastest growing economy in the world. The arrogance, the smug, sanctimonious arrogance of the BBC. 
why shouldn't a relatively poor South American nation enrich itself and its citizens via fossil fuels, just like every other advanced economy in the world has done? Now watch as the president of Guyana gives our lefty losing it a lesson in the importance of preservation. Does From that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change, I am going to lecture you on climate change because we have kept this forest alive that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that you enjoy, that the world enjoy, that you don't pay us for, that you don't value, that you don't see a value in, that the people of Guyana has kept alive. Guess what? We have the lowest deforestation rate in the world. Now, we regularly have MSNBC featuring lefties losing it. And here is a, another example. MSNBC's reporting has become so wildly deranged and unhinged, they're now pretending to go off script to emphasise their Trump derangement syndrome. You know, <laughs> it's time to do something different. Like, we're not going to have this conversation again. I have come on the air with breaking news about requests for gag orders because of threats for judges and their kids more times than I could count today before I got ready. And Judge Ludig, I think it's time. I don't know who has to write the banners at the bottom of my show. I'm sorry in advance. But Donald Trump broke the rule of law. And we should cover a broken judiciary in this country. Donald Trump managed to delay every federal criminal trial how conveniently placed that camera was for the script toss it's almost like i don't know it was rehearsed but maybe instead of rehearsing the msnbc reporters should investigate why it was app for donald trump to call out the daughter of the judge overseeing his new york hush money trial after all two democratic clients of lauren merchant's consulting firm have raised at least 93 million dollars in campaign donations while using the case in their solicitation emails. Team Trump has repeatedly called for Judge Merchant to recuse himself from the case. Joining me now is Senior Editor at Large of Newsweek, Josh Hammer. Josh, what do you make of this case and MSNBC's outrage at Trump attacking the justice system? Well, Rita, great, great to join you as always. So first of all, I mean, that clip that we just saw from MSNBC, you see the host there, she's flailing her arm. She is so apoplectic, the fact that Trump is doing everything possible to try to delay this trial. Th this is part of a much more insidious, pernicious line of argumentation that we've seen from the Democrats and their allies of late. So Jack, Jack Smith, who is the special counsel for Attorney General Merrick Garland, who is currently prosecuting Donald Trump in both Washington, D.C. and Florida. He has spoken in the past of how you have an alleged Sixth Amendment right to make sure that we have this, tr this trial conducted speedily so the government can know whether Donald Trump is guilty or innocent. He has flipped our entire Bill of Rights, our entire constitutional structure on its head. Our Bill of Rights, your First Amendment right to free speech, your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, your Third Amendment right to stay in your homes lest soldiers be there, and your Sixth Amendment right to, to a speedy trial. They exist to protect you from the government, not the other way around. So it, it is ex that exact fallacious mentality and very insidious flipping on its head, though, that, that MSNB host, MSNBC host there, excuse me, just said. So absolutely wild stuff right there. Look, the judge in this case, Juan Merchant, is an obviously far left biased judge. This is the hush money payment case. It's, it's the prosecution involving Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. Frankly, a Hollywood-esque cast of characters. You, pro you really cannot make this case up any better if you were trying to write a movie on it. But very similar to Justice Arthur and Goron, <laughs> who is the judge in the fraud trial. That's the Tish Jane fraud mm. case against the Trump organization. The, these judges read uh, almost to a T, especially in the state courts, are going to be very anti-Trump. And it makes sense because they're there in New York City, which is a far left jurisdiction. This case of the four criminal prosecutions, this hush money case, is by far the most likely of the criminal cases to actually get a verdict before November. However, Rita, it also happens to be by far the most farcical and ludicrous. In fact, when Alvin Bragg, the Soros-funded yes. DA, unveiled these charges last April, the New York Times editorial board, the New York Times editorial board was less than fully enthusiastic. CNN could barely get anyone to comment favorably on it. So I don't think that this is going to go anywhere. But for now, they're, they are just flailing their arms. They're trying to do anything whatsoever to derail this man's ambitions. Uh, we thought the... Uh... Last New York case was the most farcical possible, but this, you're right, makes that one look like it has some grounds. I mean, it is, uh, you can see why 
trust in the justice system has plummeted to historic lows in the US because people are seeing what's happening and it's very obvious that they, these are politically motivated charges. Now, let's talk about Irish Catholic President Joe Biden. He's always telling us about what a devout Catholic he is, but he hosted a very non-Christian Easter weekend at the White House, not only banning religious-themed designs from the Easter egg art contest, but also there was a much reaction to him promoting Transgender Day of Visibility, as if, you know, that group isn't visible enough the other 364 days. Uh, it's not really a day. Uh, and uh, he posted this message on Easter Sunday, which, Josh, is one of the most holy days on the Christian calendar. The reaction, I've got to say, was uh, strong. Yeah, I mean, Joe Biden, from what I saw, got ratioed pretty badly on Twitter, pretty much everyone defending it. Uh, was similarly ratioed, including Mayor Eric Adams in New York City. He was badly ratioed. Look, America is still a majority Christian country. America was founded as a fairly explicitly Christian country. I mean, yes, we obviously have a First Amendment right to free exercise. I myself am Jewish, and, and we are not forced to obey the certain dictates of a certain church or anything like that. But the, but the American founders were, were fairly explicit about their Christianity. And while America has changed in many ways, to this day, it remains both demographically, statistically, in terms of church attendance, but also just more generally speaking, more culturally, it remains a Christian country. And, and this whole controversy, this tempest in a teapot, I think is emblematic of the fact that the Democratic Party is really out over its skis when it comes to the LGBT agenda in general and its dissonance, its irreconcilable dissonance with the fact that the American people, by and large, are still commonsensical when it comes to sheer logic and are still Christian when it comes to religious identity. And it also put the Democrats, Rita, between a rock and a hard place when it comes to their intersectional coalition of aggrieved interests, because black voters actually, according to most polls, are really starting to peel away from Joe Biden. Donald Trump is picking up 20, up maybe 25 percent of black voters. If that number stands, Joe Biden's going to lose the election on that metric alone. Here's the catch, Rita. The reason why, why it's difficult is because Black voters, at least on the polling that I have seen for the past 10, 15 years very consistently, are not as down with the LGBT agenda overall as white voters are in America. So with every sop to the intersectional LGBT and especially the transgender lobby that Joe Biden makes like this, he's going to risk hemorrhaging black support even more. So he, even politically speaking, he's caught between a rock and a hard place. But, but the most important point here is that this is obviously a direct shot at Christians. He cannot afford to lose any more blue collar support. And unfortunately, he's heading in that direction, I think. Mm. And it's not just black voters who uh, aren't on board with a lot of this activism. Uh, Hispanic voters are probably even less right. so. Uh, and uh, the polling there is also showing that Trump's gaining enormous numbers. In fact, there was a New York Times uh, poll recently that had the uh, Hispanics opting for Trump by some 6% over uh, Biden, which, you know, if you said that 10 years ago or even in 2020, you, you would think that was impossible. 100%. Yeah. I mean, if, if you if you go down the list and you look at basically all the demographics that have given Democrats comfortable margins in most recent presidential elections, obviously 2016 notwithstanding, if you go, so it's black voters, Hispanic voters, and really young voters, 18 to 35. Democrats are losing support in all three of those demographics. So right now, the Hispanic vote in America seems like it's basically a toss-up. It is well within the margin of error. Some polls show it slightly to Trump. Some show yeah. it going slightly to Biden. I mean, it, it's really quite crazy, Reid. I cannot underscore this point enough. Going back 20 years, it was, it was around 2004, there was a progressive think, think tanker by the name of Roy Teixeira. And he wrote a famous book at that time called The Emerging Democrat Majority. And his basic argument was that demographics were going to make the Republican Party go extinct in the next 25, 30 years because of the, because of the Hispanic vote alone. Boyd Teixeira, to his credit, has formally disavowed and renounced his own book. But the Democratic Party officially, unfortunately, is still continuing to hemorrhage Hispanic voters. It is a huge, huge, huge deal. And what the mainstream media and the Democratic Party miss is that Hispanic voters themselves, Rita, are not any happier about the situation on the southern border than white or black voters are. They are the ones oftentimes who are actually disproportionately being harmed by the crime, the trafficking, mm, the drugs, absolutely. and all that the open border entails. And I think there's also 
ill feeling towards those who conflate legal migrants with illegal migrants, even with criminals. And, and the Democrats are guilty of doing that on a regular basis. Josh Hammer, thank you so much for your time this evening. And don't go anywhere. Coming up next, the dark underside of transgender medicine is exposed. Ben Apple is next. Welcome back. My next guest has written powerful pieces that have been read widely after being endorsed and shared by the likes of J.K. Rowling. He's a member of the LGBT community, or is he? As a gay man, Ben Apple has warned of the erasure of men like him in the pursuit of gender-affirming care. In a series of groundbreaking articles for publications like Spiked Online and The Daily Mail, and now Ben is creating waves again for an interview with a gender clinic whistleblower, Tamara Pietzi, in which the true problems of gender medicine are exposed. Ben joins me now. Ben, thank you so much for your time. Your interview and, and your previous articles all touch on the logical fallacies and excesses of the so-called uh, trans movement, the gender-affirming care model. Uh, tell me about this backward notion that's embraced there about gender norms. Uh, if you don't subscribe to uh, a particularly feminine trait, then you can't be a girl. If you've got masculine traits, then you must be a boy and, and vice versa. It's really quite backward. Uh, we've, we're supposed to be beyond that, but now we've gone back to these gender norms and a little boy liking pink and ballet may be in the wrong body. Yeah, I mean, it's really troublesome. And, you know, the thing is, is that, a lot of activists and even clinicians and and folks that are working in these spaces are really combining the the transgender with gender nonconforming. So they say like TGNC. So it's all just kind of collides into one category. And in reality, there's you know uh, uh, so many different factors that go into why someone might one be gender nonconforming, but two might happen to identify or want to identify as the opposite sex it's it's such a complex thing that that activists and clinicians are really trying to dumb down and simplify into something really easy mm. and a lot of people are being harmed um in the process but like you said now the fact that we're specifically medicalizing gender non-conforming kids who would otherwise grow up to be gay or lesbian or not but the majority of them probably would yeah. grow up to be gay or lesbian if they were just left alone. It is really a new form of conversion therapy um, that's really that's mm. really troubling, and I'm glad that you're talking about it. Well, the, the whistleblower you spoke to highlights uh, several cases, and one of those cases she treated at this gender clinic, multi-care. The patient was a 13-year-old girl, had an abusive mum, had sexual assault history, uh, terrible case, uh, had all sorts of uh, mental health issues like depression, PTSD, anxiety. She, she was on the spectrum. She had autism. And yet she was very quickly diagnosed with gender dysphoria and your whistleblower was told she should be on medication to stop her um, menstruating and, and given drugs like testosterone, really powerful drugs. She opposed this and the child was removed from her care. I, I do wonder just how widespread this issue is, how, much, how many of these gender-confused kids have got all sorts of other mental health issues or traumas in their past and they're getting this diagnosis uh, that is supposed to be the answer to all their prayers. I mean, we know that it is pretty widespread. I mean, the numbers have dramatically increased in recent years, especially since about 2013 or 2014. The the numbers of young people identifying as trans and, and going to gender clinic has, has, has skyrocketed. However, the amount of gender clinics has also skyrocketed. So, uh, you know, it, it, there we went from one to well over 100 in about, uh, I don't know, 15 years. So um, now, obviously, they're being reversed and some of them are being shut down in the U.S. Um, after legislation is closing them down. Um, 
but it is a widespread thing and there are a lot of other factors that go into why someone would want to identify out of their sex especially for young girls um you know a lot of young girls are identifying as trans in clusters the social contagion is a big part of it and there have been studies about this and as much as activists like to debunk this idea it is a, in fact a statistical reality that that there are clusters of of young girls identifying out of their sex and you know some people attribute that to social contagion another thing that can be um autism spectrum disorder like you said uh you know autistic people tend to see things in very black and white so if they have teachers and guidance counselors telling them that you know if you like pink and you like this you might not be a male on the in you know you might not be a male on the inside you might be a girl on the inside or vice versa you know if you like rough and tumble things in sports you might not be a girl you might be a boy and then others you know girls just uh, as they grow older and start to mature they're start to be sexualized and they start to be you know and they really want to uh hide from that and disguise themselves um a lot of times trans identity and identifying as a boy for young girls can be kind of they're hiding out in this identity um to mm. to prevent that kind of sexualization well puberty is, is an awkward period really just for about everybody it's not an easy few years and to add this gender confusion to the mix and provide all these so-called solutions uh, i can understand why there's so many kids who, who who are confused and we have so many cases now of these detransitioners people who have gone down this uh, path have had medical treatment some have even had irreversible surgeries and very quickly ben they've discovered this isn't the answer this isn't making them happy in fact it's making them more depressed and they detransition and go back to to the sex they were born how prevalent is that movement becoming because I've, I've spoken to a couple on this program but they have faced such hatred and such vitriol from so many in the trans community that i can understand why many others would be scared off talking because who wants to face that after everything they've been through to then be labelled a bigot and a hater and a self-loather and all sorts of other slurs, uh, you can understand why many of them stay silent. Absolutely. You, you know, uh, there are folks that say, you know, once you're trans, once you say you're not trans, like you can't say you're not trans once you're trans. You're you're out and you're you're mm. um, you know, really excommunicated from that, from that community. Um, there are a lot of detransitioners. I know many that initially started to speak out a little bit and then actually pulled back when they saw the kind of blowback that they were getting and how much of a toll it was taking on their mental health and just their lives in general. You know, for me personally, like I know tr trans adults who are happy with their decision to transition. And I know a lot of trans adults who are unhappy. And what really changed my perspective a lot, besides learning about the history of trans medicine, which is that you know speaking of adolescent transition i mean initially all of the the first young cohort about 60 i think it's 61 or 62 out of the 70 uh young people between 2001 and 2008 in amsterdam in the netherlands and amsterdam where this practice really started 62 were homosexual um so it is really mm -hmm. about medicalizing kids who are same-sex attracted Gender nonconformity is super common in childhood, especially for people who grow up to be gay and lesbian. And all cohort studies show, all studies have shown, there's about 11 to date that show that the majority of kids, maybe between like 60 and 90%, sometimes higher, but sometimes maybe 85, end up desisting. They stop experiencing what's called gender dysphoria or what used to be called gender identity disorder. If they're allowed to proceed through puberty, they grow up. And they become more comfortable in their bodies because they realize that oh i'm yeah. just a, i'm different and that's okay i'm just a gay person or I'm a, I'm a you know i'm a lesbian and and i can live and thrive we should not be turning gay people into facsimiles of straight people or you know uh mm -hmm. trying to, to to do this kind of conversion therapy but what really changed things for me was talking to these detransition gay people specifically detransition gay men and I'm, you know, working on something now, writing about that, um, and just hearing their stories about they 
gotten irreversible surgeries. They've had the bottom surgeries, a number of them, and they have severe health complications from these mm. surgeries. And so this is yeah. mistreatment. This is maltreatment. And this should be, this is a liberal issue that people should be aware of. And, and we shouldn't be medicalizing homosexuality. And we shouldn't be harming people that that shouldn't be harmed. There's a lot of other issues that go into this and they're making it a one size fits all sort of thing. Absolutely. And we, we saw that with the revelations from the WPATH files, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, uh, just shows how little science is really behind this ideology and movement. And you mentioned there some of the consequences of, of these surgeries, people losing sexual function, people becoming sterile and, and making those decisions when they're very young and not really understanding the full impact. Uh, you're doing amazing work, Ben. We look forward to your new book and thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And that's it for me tonight. Up next is Newsnight. I'll see you at 11 tomorrow. Good night.